Good evening. Great to have you with us. Happy Labor Day from all of us here at the Donlin Report. Tonight, we're taking a look back at a few of our most interesting segments from the summer. As we approach the 20th anniversary of 9-11, many are still seeking answers about what happened that day. Will the Biden administration declassify top secret documents, including what role, if any, the Saudis played? I spoke with the survivor. And with enhanced unemployment benefits ending today, will Americans start getting back to work as many businesses struggle to hire? I asked John Taffer of Bar Rescue about his outlook for the economy. Plus, our exclusive look at the NFL's concussion settlement policy, why African-American players were treated differently than white players. That and much more on a special Labor Day edition of the Don Report. Hello and welcome to our show tonight, Labor Day, September 6, 2021. With the dog days of summer winding down and fall on the horizon, we're taking a look back at our top stories from the past few months. Certainly been a wild time in America and the world for that matter with the Delta variant still raging. But as America continues to bounce back, it is important to look forward. This Saturday marks 20 years since the 9-11 attacks, a day that will never be forgotten. I spoke with a 9-11 survivor about why he is still looking for answers today. Good evening. Two numbers. It's all you need. Two numbers that stand alone and speak volumes about one of the darkest days in our history. Certainly the deadliest attack on U.S. soil. Those two numbers, of course, 9-11. Five weeks from tomorrow, we will mark 20 years since the attack. But another story is coming to light now that's threatening to overshadow the event. There are nearly 1,800 people directly affected by 9-11 now asking President Biden not to come to any of the memorial events this year. Now, that type of request is almost always noteworthy for obvious reasons, but it's even more salient with this because 9-11 was arguably the last time this country was unilaterally united. We all remember the pain and the patriotism. President Bush standing on the rubble of the World Trade Towers with a megaphone shouting out to a country deeply damaged. Flags that lined neighborhood streets. Our lives came to a halt as we all came together. Which gets us back to today. Why wouldn't victims' families want the president to take part? Well, they want more information, information the group says candidate Biden promised to release, a pledge to declassify U.S. government evidence about what happened that day, and primarily whether Saudi Arabian leaders had any connection to the attacks. According to a statement released today, the group says, through multiple administrations, the Department of Justice and FBI have actively sought to keep this information secret and prevent the American people from learning the full truth about the 9-11 attacks. The last three administrations declined to release key documents for national security reasons. The Saudi government denies any involvement. And for victims' families, well, it remains an open wound. that They're still looking to heal 20 years later. And that's where we start tonight. Joining me is Tim Froelich, 9-11 survivor. He was in the South Tower, seriously injured his legs. And he's one of those who signed on to this letter to the president. Tim, first of all, thank you for being with us. We appreciate it. Uh, this is a strong statement, Tim. What went into this decision for you and the others who signed on? Well, you know, first of all, thank you. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, I'm, I'm certainly honored to be able to, to stand here and, and speak out. Um, what, what went into it was the idea now that, that we've gone through three administrations who um, have basically not helped us. And, and the opportunity here for the Biden administration to do the right thing and release these documents after 20 years really will be an example or could be an example of the transparency that he promised. Are you convinced the U.S. government is hiding something, Tim? Yes, I am. Um, we're aware through our investigators that that these documents um, are being kept in secret, uh, potentially for em embarrassing uh, issues that have come up or that came up in the plot, as well as in the investigation of of 9/11. Um, and I'm I'm fully confident that these documents certainly need to come out. The American public need to know the real truth, and certainly in in our fight in court. The families deserve the opportunity to have these documents presented in court for a fair, uh, for a fair potential trial and a fair potential outcome. 
Tim, if these materials and these documents are classified, I guess the question would be, how do you know what's in them? Have you heard anything about at all what's in these documents and what exactly you want released? No, but, but my question, and, and I think the 9-11 community's question at this point is, why after 20 years? What's, why after 20 years? What, what are we hiding after 20 years? I mean, we've been through, as you said, we've been through three administrations, and, and um, we're confident and we're hopeful that we're not going to be going through a fourth here as we get closer to, to the biggest anniversary, really. I mean, they're all important, right. but this is 20 years now. And, and if there's nothing here to cover up, and if there's nothing here to hide, then why are these documents not out? That is the question. Why aren't they out? What have you heard? What have you been told? Well, we have had we, we have had state secrets declared um, a, against us um, by the prior administration. Um, Attorney General Barr went ahead and did that um, after uh, the families were fortunate enough to meet with you know to meet with President Trump. Um, the very next day, the Department of Justice and the FBI classified those documents and, in essence, said, "We have the documents, and you can't have them." Is there any chance and, that they ever and, will and be? We released? have. Go ahead. I, I am hopeful. You know, I'm, I'm hopeful that the Biden administration here um, is going to, to follow up with, with being transparent to, to the American public. Um, is as it well up as to the, the president families. alone, Tim? Can the president I, unilaterally I, do it? I believe, yes, I believe the president is in a position, as well as Attorney General Garland and members of the administration are in a position to review these documents and to the best way possible release information to not only the 9-11 families but also the public on who is behind the plot who supported the terrorists mm -hmm. when they arrived in the united states um, who provided financial support for their car their rent their housing i mean when these guys arrived in january of 2000 they knew nothing and had nothing they they were they were on a journey to inflict the evil pain of 9-11 against this country. And that's exactly what they did. But they needed help. Why now, Tim? They why needed this, help. Why with this president? Is it because he is, uh, as a candidate, pledged to be more transparent? Well, yes. I mean, w what the families are asking for the Biden administration, we're asking him to uphold one of the promises that he made to us, not only as... 9-11 family members, but also a, a, as a country. We're asking for transparency. Right. You know, we want the truth. We want the truth. Um, I, we believe the truth is in those documents as far as who supported the plot. Um, we, we have written countless, countless letters mm. to many administrations over the years, um, including the Biden administration now, and asked for a meeting. We, right. we would be open to sitting yeah, I'm with, sure. With the president. Hey, Tim, before, um, before I let you go. Have, and, and we have not received we have not received a response, unfortunately. Right. Go I ahead. have one more question for you. Coming up on 20 years, I can only imagine uh, what this has been like for you. Um, does it right. every day feel like it, this happened yesterday to you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I you know, I, I know I, I personally live with the nightmares um, of not only my own experience, but but what I saw um that day um you know I, I lost my i lost my best friend that day i was with him for a period of time um but you know one of the things that gives me hope as we approach this day is that we will all unite and we will all go towards the truth and the transparency and the facts mm -hmm. about what really happened that day and who was behind it mm -hmm. and that's something that i'm very optimistic about and, I, and i'm hopeful for our country yeah. about uh, because the unity that that provided that day um, is something that we can we can get back and, and we can also learn a great deal about the facts of this plot right. and actually this mass murder, which it's the greatest mass murder in American history. Right. And there's been no one held accountable for this. Tim no Prolick, 9-11 uh, survivor, it's great to have your voice tonight. Thank you very much. Enjoy the weekend. Well, a lot has changed over the years, but some things haven't. After the U.S. pullout of Afghanistan, the Taliban is once again 
in control there. The same Taliban that protected then al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden, leader and mastermind of the 9-11 attacks. And Americans are still waiting for answers about possible foreign involvement in the plot. I spoke with an attorney representing 9-11 victims and another advocate for 9-11 families, someone who lost a loved one in the attack. Now to what started the war in Afghanistan, the attacks on September 11th, 2001. The 20-year memorial is coming up next month, but nearly 2,000 victims, their families and first responders do not want President Biden to attend. They want the Biden administration to release classified documents on 9-11. And we spoke with one of them on Friday. My question, and, and I think the 9-11 community's question at this point is, why after 20 years? What's, why after 20 years, what, what are we hiding? Now, the Biden administration says it does intend to disclose some classified documents and have the Department of Justice take a fresh look at others. Joining us now, someone who thinks President Biden should be at the anniversary. He also represents thousands who got sick after inhaling toxins during the 9-11 attacks. Michael Barish. Michael, thanks for your time. We appreciate it. We said Friday uninviting a president is a pretty serious statement. You think that went too far? Oh, it's the wrong move, clearly. But I share that gentleman's frustrations. I represent over 25,000 people who are really sick from inhaling the toxic dust and over 1,500 families who have lost loved ones from the 68 cancers linked. Mm -hmm. And believe me, they want to see these documents. They're entitled to see these documents. The frustration is real. But they would be incredibly insulted if the president didn't show on the anniversary. Instead, let's use this time to, look, we're moving out of Afghanistan, finally. OK, great. Why not divulge all these, declassify these documents mm -hmm. and let the 9-11 community learn once and for all whether Saudi Arabia bears any culpability? Because after all, 19 of the 20 hijackers were coincidentally from Saudi Arabia. Someone had to sponsor these people. Someone had to pay for their air flight lessons, their hotel rooms, their food. I think we deserve to know. Yep. But I'm not in favor of demanding that the president not come, and neither are any of my clients. Right. Michael, so our guest on Friday said many of those exact same things. And I guess the question would be, 20 years later, why not release them? Because by not releasing them, you're going to allow some to question whether the U.S. government is hiding something. Well, I don't think they're hiding them, but let's face it, we don't have a lot of friends in the Mideast. We have Israel and we have Saudi Arabia, for better or worse. So by not divulging this information, it begs the question, what are they hiding? Maybe not hiding, but why are they protect, protecting Saudi Arabia? It doesn't make any sense after 20 years. This would be a golden opportunity for President Biden and the Justice, Justice Department to come clean. Look, let's face it. Biden's only been in power, uh, been our president for six months. But President Bush had eight years to do it. President Obama had eight years to do it. Right. President uh, Trump had four years to do it. None of them did it. So I beg you, President Biden, do what your predecessors didn't do and let the 9-11 community know what who really was behind these attacks. All right, well, we will certainly be thinking of you and all of your clients coming up here next month as we mark 20 years since those attacks. Attorney Michael Barish, thank you so much for your time tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Joining me now, someone who lost a loved one on 9-11, now spends her time advocating for other victims' families. Terry Strada joins us now. Terry, it's good to have you. Let me start by asking what's going through your mind watching this unfold in Afghanistan as we come up on 20 years in just a few weeks here of the 9-11 attacks. I am appalled and I am horrified. I'm horrified for the Afghan people and I'm horrified for the rest of the world. I'm horrified for America. What could possibly happen now that all of these jihadists have been unleashed? You know, they, they let them out of the jails. They're running freely and they, you know, chanting death to Americans just like they always have. Um, so we're in serious trouble here if we don't do something about it. You're worried about uh, additional terror cells and terrorists, I guess, basically being emboldened by this? 
Oh, of course. I mean, we had cells here in the United States prior to the attack um, that were put in place by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. You know, they sent their agents over here to meet and greet these hijackers and to give them their housing, their bank accounts, help them with their flying lessons, everything that they needed 12 to 18 months prior to the attacks. And we've never admitted, our government has never admitted to us the role that the kingdom played. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have any reason to believe that these cells don't still exist or that they couldn't easily pop up again and that jihadists could definitely you know, infiltrate our country and we could definitely see something like 9-11 or worse. Um, but, you know, there's been so many secrets kept from the American people, kept from the 9-11 families. The Department of Justice keeps documents from us and, and the FBI and they overclassify and they state secrets on things. And it's time that we get full transparency and a full accounting of what happened on 9-11. And you're working on that right now, are you not? There's a bipartisan uh, bill, as I understand it, on the table right now that would uh, declassify a lot of these documents. Yes, absolutely. This happened two weeks ago, and I'm very excited about it because it will, it's a mandatory declassification review process for all the documents, all the documents that have been kept from us, all the documents that they've overly classified and put state secrets on. And there's an accountability mechanism within this bill that now they have to report every mm -hmm. single reason that they're going to do something like keep it from us or classify it to the United States Congress. So we need the president to call on this bill and get it on his desk as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And let's start unraveling all of the truths about 9-11 so we can protect ourselves going forward. Terry, I thought about you today when I knew you were joining us, and, and I wondered what you must have felt in 2011 when U.S. troops killed Osama bin Laden. Did that serve as at least some closure for you? Well, what it meant to me was he was an incredibly evil man, right, and he, and he had a following. So to eliminate that kind of evil from the planet was a good positive thing, but it didn't have a strong impact on my life or the quest for the truth. I mean, we've still just been fighting so hard mm -hmm. to find out about the financing of al-Qaeda, to find out the, how all of this logistical support goes on. And until we take the blinders off about the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and start to hold them accountable for, you know, the role that they've played. Um, yeah, I was glad he was killed. It was a good thing. It was a brave thing. It was an incredible investigation to find him and hunt him down and do it. Um, so glad we have people like that working right. for us. But we need to do more. All right. Well, uh, three administrations have kept much of this information classified. We'll see if uh, this time around it's any different. Terry Strada, thank you so much for your time. We'll certainly be thinking about you as we get closer to 9-11, and maybe we'll check in either before or after. Good to have you. Okay. Thank you so much. With enhanced unemployment benefits ending today for many unemployed Americans, will they head back to work as businesses struggle to hire? John Taffer of Bar Rescue gives his take on the new American worker. And don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. There are a record number of job openings right now, but a lot of Americans are still reluctant to get back to work. I spoke with Bar Rescue's John Taffer about the post-COVID economy. While U.S. job openings reached 10.1 million in June, there are still more than eight and a half million unemployed Americans, according to the U.S. Department of Labor, meaning businesses are still struggling to hire. Joining me now, friend of the program, John Taffer, Bar Rescue host and executive producer. John, it's always great to see you, and it's great to have you tonight. So, so millions of Americans are unemployed, and there are a record number of job openings. What gives? You, you know, Joe, thank you for having me back. I went to bring my dog to the veterinarian the other day because he wasn't feeling well, and the vet couldn't give me an appointment for a week because they don't have their employees. Yeah. I went to a retail store. They didn't have employees to check out. This isn't specific to the restaurant industry. It seems to be across all industries. And here's what worries me, Joe. <clears throat> As you know, we have 10 million jobs available, we read this morning. Mm -hmm. Has America's psyche changed have we, from being a self-reliant society, are we starting to become a government-reliant society? Hmm. People are sitting home rather than going to work. When they, even with even money, 
I suggest that pre-pandemic, for the same dollars, people probably would have gone to work hmm. to get a promotion, invest in their future, accomplish something. Today, there seems to be a different mentality change. It's extremely frustrating. Here in Las Vegas, Joe, restaurants are open four and five days a week because we can't staff for seven days right. a week. Yeah, you know, we went out, John, for dinner on Sunday night, and there was a big A-frame sign out in front of the restaurant offering $500 to come and work there. I mean, just a, a straight bonus if you come and work there. So paying more money is, is still a, a struggle for these businesses that are trying to find people and pay them more. You know, I was with the president of one of the largest gaming companies the other day, and he told me that because the employees aren't coming back, they're making modifications with technology and logistical changes and such. He feels when this is over, we might need 20% less employees because business must go on, Joe. We're finding solutions, whether it's automated ordering systems. My Taffer's Tavern restaurant concept is all computerized and robotic cooking techniques. So business is seeking solutions. And I think about 20% of these jobs are going to get replaced with technology. So and if I can give an example. Yeah, go so ahead. The other day I was at a hotel. I ordered some breakfast and room service. My phone rings. I answer it. And the phone says, your robot is at the door with your room service. Hmm. I opened my door. And sure enough, there was a robot with my food. I took my food. The robot said, thank you, and went on down the hallway. That eliminated eight or ten employees from that hotel. And these are the things that industry is going to have to do. John, last time we talked, we also talked about your fears of costs going up because they were going up. You itemized them, and we found out today that prices are going up again. Production prices not only are going up, but consumer prices as well. How worried are you about this uptick for the service industry? Very much so. You know, we can increase the price of a hamburger by 20, 30, 40 percent, but that's the kind of price hits we're getting. So the restaurant industry can't pay pass it on to the consumer quite as easily as other restaurants. So I look at a friend with a pizza place, Joe, a pizza restaurant went out of business last week. He didn't have the employees to work it. He survived the pandemic, invested his last dollars in it. And now that the pandemic is supposedly winding down, he lost his business then. So this crisis isn't ending for my industry. I don't think we're close to an end yet. John, we had uh, Jared Bernstein on last week, White House economic uh, advisor. And I asked him what he would say to mom and pop stores and restaurant owners. Here's a bit of the clip. The president has said that the enhanced benefits will roll off in September as planned. Uh, and the important thing there is that people have ample, strong uh, opportunities to, to go into with growing wages. And that's what we saw in today's report. A sound effect apparently added there, John, but uh, not a lot yeah, of help. This, of, is, this is your sweet spot. What a bunch spot. of gobbledygook that was. What, what did you tell that small business owner, John? You know, just tell the small business owner that these programs are not being effective right now. We can't grow our economy and sustain these businesses as long as we encourage people to stay home. And there's a change in mentality to stay home because of the pandemic. We can't fuel it. And we're hearing about it from you. John Taffer, Bar Rescue, thanks for your time tonight. Good to see your time tonight. Good to see you. My pleasure, my friend. Coming up, our exclusive look at the NFL's concussion settlement policy, why African-American players were treated differently than white players, and Super Bowl-winning quarterback Jim McMahon shares his struggles. Seen only here on News Nation, our exclusive five-part series on the NFL's concussion settlement. Why were African-American players treated differently than white players? Rich McHugh has that report. football shaped my life. I had accomplished everything that I thought that I could accomplish. He's third in all-time sacks for the New York Giants, a two-time Super Bowl champion, three-time Pro Bowler, and twice voted the NFL's Defensive Lineman of the Year. Safe to say Leonard Marshall earned his spot among NFL royalty. He retired from the game at age 33. Ten years later, Marshall says something was off. Yeah, I began to notice things with my behavior. I began to notice things were slipping, and I began to notice my patience was running thin uh, with people I loved and cared about. I didn't quite understand it. I came home, and he said I had an episode, and I called the local authorities, and I felt I wanted to kill myself. Leonard's wife, Lisa. He couldn't express it. He just felt it, that he felt like 
his world was crumbling, and I couldn't understand why because it came out of the blue. In 2013, he volunteered to have his brain studied by a team at UCLA using PET scans to look for evidence of CTE, a progressive degenerative brain disease found in people with a history of repeated head trauma. They concluded that Marshall did, in fact, have CTE. Was there any warning that this might be a bad thing for your mental health or your brain or anything like that? Back in my era of football, we didn't talk about concussions. There was no warning whatsoever. I mean, I knew when I signed up to play in the National Football League that I would get beaten, battered, and bruised. But what I didn't know was that traumatic brain injury would become so prevalent. But the NFL was aware at least as early as 1994, the year Marshall retired. It was then that NFL Commissioner Paul Tagliabu created the Mild Traumatic Brain Injury Committee. Asked about it publicly at the time, he dismissed the problem, calling concussions, quote, one of these packed journalism issues, and said that the number of concussions is, quote, relatively small. I've played 13 years and I've suffered many injuries. Today, Marshall is one of over 20,000 former NFL players who have registered in the NFL concussion settlement. I am also one of the players who's fighting for equitable treatment. Those diagnosed with ALS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and dementia are eligible to receive a monetary award. CTE, however, was excluded from the settlement. Leonard had started with the process of confirming that he had CTE through UCLA. Marshall's attorney, Jason Lukasevic, filed the first cases against the NFL and originated the NFL concussion litigation. He had seen some other doctors prior to the settlement becoming effective. He said, look, he, he has many neurodegenerative issues. Diagnosed with dementia and Parkinson's disease, Marshall filed a claim with the NFL concussion settlement. In 2017, his claim for Parkinson's disease was approved, entitling him to a monetary award of $1.9 million. But months later, the NFL claims administrator reviewed his claim and reversed the award, stating that his Parkinson's diagnosis was not generally consistent with the settlement criteria because his condition was, quote, stable, not characteristic of the progressive decline of Parkinson's, and also because alternative Alternative explanations are likely, namely CTE. Just like that. And that I had to see another set of doctors. And I'm like, what kind of game is this? You're approved. Actually, hang on. You're not approved. We challenge this and you got to go through the whole testing all over again. Correct. And in the process of seeing those doctors, his neuropsychological tests somehow improved. But the reasoning and rationale that they did is because they applied race-based normative data to Leonard. The settlement agreement negotiated by the NFL required the neuropsychologist to apply the race-based norms, which is to say they adjusted Marshall's results because he is black. His examination results stated very clearly, all scores below are demographically adjusted based on Mr. Marshall's age, education, gender, and race. The NFL in June said they would end the controversial practice referred to as race norming, a practice that made it harder for black retirees to show a deficit and qualify for an award. The claims administrator would not comment on Marshall's claim to News Nation. It makes me feel like, well, I don't even want to say the, 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 the explicit word. Uh, I think you'll, you'll get the gist of my drift with that. Um, it hurts. When race is used to differentiate between people of the same group organization, that's a civil rights violation and it needs investigated. I am a victim of race norming. I am a victim of race norming. Race norming is ridiculous. It's got to go. Class counsel Chris Seeger, he's got to go. Chris Seeger, the attorney who negotiated the settlement on behalf of the players, toured the country in 2017 singing its praises. I think it's really, really good. And it accomplishes the goal that we uh, set out to achieve from day one, which was to get Get help to the players and their families who need it now. Seeger also initially said he saw no evidence of racial bias in the administration of the settlement fund, but recently pivoted and apologized for any pain the program has caused. He also said those with a diagnosis prior to 2017 would be paid. Because if you have a diagnosis of a neurocognitive or neuromuscular problem before that date, and it was done by a board-certified legitimate doctor, those diagnoses will be honored in the settlement. But that's not what happened with Marshall. Seeger declined to comment, citing a recent gag order in the case. Because this isn't a settlement. This is a claims process that less than 5% of the former players have only been paid. I truly believe that the Attorney General's Office or the Department of Justice needs to look at what's going on here. In the seven years since the settlement was created, NFL 
reports 20,558 registered class members, just over 3,200 claim packages received, less than 1,300 players have been paid. And yet, the attorney who negotiated the settlement, Chris Seeger, has been awarded at least $64 million by the judge presiding over this case. Why is there unfairness to these former players? It's obvious it's a broken system. Why is everybody getting paid but these former players? It's obvious that something has failed here. If you were a football fan in the 1980s, you're familiar with our next guest, Jim McMahon. He loved the spotlight and wasn't afraid to say what was on his mind, but a lot has changed since his playing days, and McMahon says CTE is to blame. The 1985 Chicago Bears, one of those NFL teams that come along once in a lifetime. With a colorful cast of characters, they shuffled their way to one of the single greatest season achievements of any NFL team. A feat still stands today, but... More than 35 years later, there's a dark side to the story. Many team members have struggled with the effects of traumatic brain injuries, including CTE. In part five of our exclusive investigation, News Nation's Rich McHugh spoke with Super Bowl winning quarterback Jim McMahon, and he opened up about his own battle with the degenerative brain disease and the effects it's had on other team members as well. Is your name Jim McMahon? Yes. He's one of the most legendary QBs to play the game. Larger than life on the field and off, Jim McMahon led the Chicago Bears to their first Super Bowl title in 1985. That was just an epic moment. When you think back to that team, what comes to mind? We were pretty damn good. People didn't want to play us. <laughs> I mean, we had a lot of fun. We worked our ass off now. Don't, don't get me wrong. Mike Taylor was not an easy guy to play for. See that? That's your IQ, buddy. Zero. It paid off. Finishing the season like we did, that was, that was the way to do it. Back in Chicago for his forthcoming documentary about his life, Mad Mac, the memory of Jim McMahon, he reunited with some of his Bears teammates. I always love coming back to the city. This town's always treated me great. If you play hard and you win, they'll love you forever. Uh, they still talk about that team. They miss the fun that we had. And that's what people still talk to me about. Oh, man, you guys look like you were having so much fun. And that Bears team actually brought a lot of excitement back to football. Super Bowl shuffle. I'm the punky QB known as McMahon. When I hit the turf, I've got no plan. When you show up to, I think, one of your first press conferences drinking a beer, <laughs> it's like a different different energy in town. And they made a big stink about it. I'm like, damn, I just took a three-hour flight and an hour car ride. I got a little thirsty. I enjoy the, uh, the game itself, and I enjoy you know, being a fool sometimes. It's just uh, people, a, lot, a lot of people are just worried about what everybody else thinks. And I can give a damn what everybody else thinks. Oh, God. Hey, man. Of the gods. How are you doing today? My body feels as good as it's going to feel after 18 plus surgeries. I went back to uh, Medellin, Colombia two years ago, had 275 million stem cells put in my body. So I think that helped me a lot. My head is really the worst of my uh, problems. In 2012, McMahon was diagnosed with early onset dementia. I was losing my mind. Started having these bad thoughts and really bad headaches. I'd be laying in a dark room for weeks at a time. How old were you at the time? I was probably just over 50. It's not a good feeling. You know, when your brain starts messing with you, you don't, you don't know what to do. I've had teammates kill themselves, and I, I couldn't believe it, you know, how somebody could take their life like that. But after I started having this, those same thoughts myself, had I had a gun, I, I wouldn't be here. Because my head hurt so bad that I just, you know, I, I, the only way to get rid of it is just be done and uh, thank God that didn't happen. But. McMahon says the NFL is to blame. I think they need to take care of the guys that put their lives on the line for this sport. How are your teammates doing today? A lot of these guys are struggling. A lot of my teammates, uh, Steve McMichael in particular, he's one of the biggest, strongest guys ever played in the NFL. And now he's he's in a wheelchair, you know, blowing through a tube to get around and can't use his arms or his legs. He's got ALS. A groundbreaking study at Boston University found CTE, a progressive degenerative brain disease found in people with a history of repeated head trauma in the brains of 99%. 110 out of 111 brains of former NFL players. I know I have CTE. McMahon says he played through at least five concussions. I mean, the way you played, you went, you went at people. You were, you were not afraid. I mean, you had to know at the time that playing football was going to be harmful to your body. Did you have any idea that it was going to have an effect on your brain? No. 
No, nobody ever mentioned the brain. I mean, everybody knows you're going to have bad knees, bad shoulders, but nobody ever mentioned the brain to, you know, to anybody. You know, the league knew how, how bad this game is for you. They knew what was going to happen long term to a lot of these guys, and that information wasn't, wasn't told to us. McMahon was one of the first to sue the NFL in 2011 for failing to properly treat players for concussions and trying to conceal for decades any links between football and brain injury. I want to find out what's, what these guys knew and whether or not we're going to be compensated for our uh, problems. And unfortunately, I was flat out denied. More players filed suit against the NFL. And in 2017, the NFL concussion settlement was finalized to compensate former players who suffer from cognitive issues related to their time in the NFL. So I've spoken to a number of players in the past six months. They've been diagnosed with dementia and they've been awarded and then they've been denied. What in your opinion is going on here? They're trying to hide the fact that they knew about everything. I think one of the conditions of settling the lawsuit was they didn't have to say what they knew. There's no doubt they know what's going on. I mean, they're very powerful people and they can they can make stuff go away. A lot of former players and current players are afraid to speak out against the NFL. You're, you're clearly not. I've never had a problem. Why is it they're always right, you know? It's my life too. And I want to find out what the hell is going on with me. And uh, at least now I know. But a lot of these guys do not. And that's, that's still the biggest problem. And Rich McHugh joins us now with more on this piece. It's alarming, Rich, to hear him talk about how dark the darkest days were. If he'd had a gun, after seeing what his other teammates had done, that says a lot. I was shocked. I, growing up in Chicago, you know, he's an icon here and right. uh, woven into the fabric of our lives. And to hear him say that just directly to me was, was shocking. I mean, I know he's, he's been talking about it a little bit in the, in the years past, but to hear him say it so directly and so clearly, and he's, he's so unafraid to speak out on this issue, uh, it's, 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 it's a breath of fresh air to me as a reporter. You can tell as well that what's happened to his teammates has had a tremendous impact, impact on him as well. Certainly. I mean, he, we, we spoke a little bit about it, that he's, um, you know, he was recently at, I believe, this event for Steve McMichael, who mm -hmm. has come down with ALS, who's just really a shell of his former self. Right. Um, he mentioned Dave Duerson, who famously took his own life. Uh, he, he shot himself in the, in, the, in the chest so as to preserve his brain, right. so his brain could be studied for research. Well, Jim said he, he knows he has CT. Typically, that's post-mortem when it's diagnosed. How does he know? Well, there's a lot of um, doctors now focusing on trying to diagnose CTE in people who are alive. And he believes that his, do his doctors have told him this. But what his doctors have told him is that, you know, because he's had a broken neck at one point in his career, mm. the spinal fluid uh, can't regulate properly and can't come up into his brain and then go down. And so it just sits on his brain. And that's where the CTE comes from. It just sits there and festers in clouds. So every Every several months, he has to go visit his doctor in New York, and they drain, literally drain the fluid ah. from his brain. All right, Rich McHugh, it's been a fascinating series. We appreciate it, and it's good to get the update. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for having me. I want to make sure that I'm not exposed to anything. Hey, get out of here. Guys, you guys are all gone. You don't need to have to pay. Get out of here. Take these off. You can't pull the mask off. Get out of here. You're gonna take my mask off my face? Get out of here. Go. We told you to leave. Sorry, I protected everybody. Next time, I'll, I'll get COVID and I'll cough on people. It's fine. Yeah. Everyone likes a wise guy, right? Well, one restaurant with a no vaccine policy wasn't having it. That's coming up. You've seen the signs no shirt, no shoes, no service. A restaurant has put its own spin on that phrase, instead only allowing customers who haven't been vaccinated. Why would a restaurant do that? Comedian Ben Glebe was determined to find out. A restaurant in Huntington Beach, California, which is doing the opposite of taking COVID precautions. In fact, in order to eat there, customers have to prove they're not vaccinated against COVID-19. Comedian Ben Glebe went there to see it himself. We'll see a little bit more about how it went. Get out of here. Guys, you guys are all gone. You don't need to take it out of here. Take these off. You can't pull the mask off. Get out of here. You're going to take my mask off my face? Get out of here. Go. We told you to leave. Sorry, I protected everybody. Next time, I'll, I'll get COVID yeah, and I'll cough on people. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> so Ben Glebe joins me now for more. Uh, troublemaker? 
<laughs> well, people are doing things that are putting people at risk, so I figured I would take a, uh, an amount of risk myself to come and expose it and see how serious they were about this absurd policy. The, the clip after you see him rip it off my face, it misses the part where they physically throw me, they physically push me out of the restaurant. You just kind of see him handling me at the end. Um, Troublemakers, sure, but sometimes you have to expose the crazy people out there trying to uh, have at it with people's health. Yeah, I, I, I saw the clip earlier today, and I didn't realize till I just heard it again there. At least you got a free meal out of the deal, right? That is true, yes. I, I ordered a lasagna that never came. They, they threw me out before that happened, but I did enjoy a uh, mediocre seizure salad, so that was cool. Okay, yeah, in fact, we have more on that. Let's play that clip now because this is what happened after they actually – escorted you out into the parking lot. Here's the exchange you had. That was a pretty good Caesar salad, though. Thank you for that. To, to me, the customer service is what the main positive there was, you know? <laughs> so you had the COVID cacciatore as well, is that right? I uh, hopefully not. Hopefully not. I just tested myself uh, earlier today, and I'm I'm clear, so I don't think I, I caught it or catch a Tory did either. I'm doing a live talk show tonight at NowhereComedyClub.com, and we're shooting that as a hidden camera bit for the show because I'm a comedian, but I like to have some things with some social worth in my shows as well, and kind of interesting looks at, at different things. And uh, that's why I had to test myself today because we have a small, masked, and vaccinated studio audience, and um, it was a pretty wild event. I did not expect them to get physical with me. Or right, never. yeah. It, it almost looked like this thing was going to come to blows there because they did follow you out to the parking lot. The other thing on a serious note, they did say that this was all about freedom for them, which is interesting. It, that freedom apparently doesn't include the freedom to wear a mask if you want. Yes, and not just the freedom to wear a mask. So this is how far gone our brains are now from having any sort of common sense. Not only does it not follow science to not wear a mask, but if you're so against wearing it, that's your choice as a free person. But then to, to, to be so anti-mask that you don't allow somebody else the freedom to do what you're claiming is the reason you won't do it, it literally is devoid of all logic. And then to take it a step further, rip my mask off, pull me up, and then be breathing into my mouth. The guy practically kissed me. <laughs> you're putting potential COVID in my mouth. That's basically a Attempted murder. That's attempted oh, slow murder. Wow. That's not cool. I got to tell you, Ben, too, I think one of my favorite things, I'm always looking for the sight gags, and I don't know if this was intentional, but the members only touch was really nice. Thank you. I'm a big members only fan. I've got them in all colors. I got like 10 of them. And uh, it doesn't speak well to my fashion sense that now I can only put them on when I'm playing weird people going to anti vax restaurants, but so be it. Was there plexiglass up in that restaurant? There was not. Apparently, that's very dangerous. We're getting everything wrong instinctually. It's amazing. The thing that we all immediately did, apparently, is just blasting germs back at us. This is a big development. Apparently, soon, we're, 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 we're probably going to learn that, I don't know, washing your hands somehow is also, it, it makes the germs angry, and it makes them come back stronger. Who knows? Well, it's, it was a funny bit and an enjoyable bit, and I think we all needed to laugh despite the seriousness of the topic. Ben Glebe, it's great to have you. Enjoy the weekend, my friend. We're going to take a break. When we come back, America's longest war is finally over. But for many families, it was a painful ending. How Americans came together to pay tribute. Coming up.